This is Phil Barassa, and you're listening to Whelm, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, zero, one. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, one, two. Hello team, welcome back, and thanks for joining us for episode 19 of Whelmed Season 3. My name is Rich, and I'm here with my co-host Emily. Hey everybody, in these review episodes, we'll be diving into the plots, characters, Easter eggs, comic book history, and everything else of Young Justice, and use all of that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we will be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. There are metateens out there who are also lost and alone. Someone needs to be there for these kids. If not us, then who? Mom, you're right. Now that we're in the open, we're targets. But really, that's nothing new. Metateens feel like they're in the crosshairs all the time. Someone has to empower them. If not us, then who? You and I have had tough times, but we always find our way. I want nothing more than for us to be a family. You know families of Metateens are being torn apart every day. Someone needs to show them families can survive and stay together. If not you and me, then who? Whom? And with all that, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The title of this week's episode is Elder Wisdom. The release date was July 23rd, 2019. The in-episode dates are December 31st through January 1st. The writer was Paul Giacopo, and the director was Christopher Berkeley. And, as always, the voice director was Jamie Thomason. In addition to the regular cast and their familiar characters, we also have... Bruce Greenwood as, of course, both Batman slash Bruce and Matthew Matches Malone. I'll get into that later. Gray Griffin as Troya and Leah Briggs. Danica McKellar, of course, doing the voice of Matches Malone's daughter, Moira Malone. Uh, Jeff Pearson back as Jay Garrick. And in the tradition of Young Justice, Mae Whitman, both as Wonder Girl and her mother, Helena Sandsmark. Everyone's parents just sound like them, but several years older. And all the actors are so good at aging their voices up and down. It's so great. It's a what skill. a skill. It's a skill. Yeah. Just in time for your next mission. Episode 19 begins at the UN Climate Conference in Bondasa, where both Garth and Donna Troy are attacked by mass figures claiming to be part of the Bunden Independence Front. However, the outsiders are there and prevent the assassination attempts while also rescuing a mind-controlled metatine in the process. However, as the fight is winding down, the Flash arrives on the scene to wrap everything up, having been called in by Lex Luthor, who's just trying to prove that the current system works just fine. And he was right this time, but only this time. (laughs) Never trust Lex Luthor. Beast Boy thinks that they were set up by Lex, but neither the team nor the League can actually prove it was a setup, which makes that claim a bit more difficult. A little bit. When the Outsiders arrive back in Taos, McGann tries to confront Halo about her recent reckless behavior, while Ed's father tries to forbid Ed from participating in the Outsiders. Both these conversations go pretty much nowhere, though, and all of the Outsiders leave together via boom tube. The next day at the premiere building, Jace informs Violet that she and her mentor, mysterious mentor, still haven't found a solution to Halo's apparent cell death issue, and the Outsiders get a social media distress call from a young girl in Ireland who's apparently been attacked by Professor Ivo's monkey robots. But before our heroes can head out, three of their parents uh, and or guardians, however they fit in this (laughs) paradigm, arrive on the scene and prevent their kids from risking their lives again. While Beast Boy, Static, and Blue Beetle go off to save the day, Cassie, Bart, and Ed have to stay behind to work things out with their various guardians, various people in charge of teen superheroes. Uh, While the family fight continues downstairs, Brion confronts Violet about how distant she's been lately, and she admits to kissing Harper. And then 
after that goes far better than she expected, uh, tells both Brion and Tara that Gabrielle Dow aided in the assassination of their parents, which sends Tara into a near panic attack as Brion storms out of the room and says nothing more. Yep. And great. It's great. Uh, in Dublin, the outsiders find their way to a warehouse full of Lex Luthor's spider bots where they battle Ivo's monkeys and rescue the girl who called them. And back in L.A., because we're jumping all over the world this week, <laughs> Cassie, Ed, and Bart convince their parents and guardians to let them continue working with the Outsiders. And after this, we get a G. Gordon Godfrey broadcast featuring Lex Luthor, who gets completely humiliated by the continued international support for the Outsiders. Later in Gotham City, a meeting of the secret anti-light reveals that the entire Dublin mission was a setup to further cement the Outsiders' good reputation. And we all have mixed feelings. Roll credits. Let's feel the Aster. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the Aster. Crashing that mode. You want me to go first? You want to go first? Who wants to go first? Who talks first? Yeah, I'll go first. Go for it. Uh, the Airedale Initiative. Let's dive in deep right off the bat. Go for it, Rich. The Airedale Initiative is where uh, Ed Dorado's dad, Ed Dorado Sr., works. And it was the <clears throat> it's the initiative that created the Zeta Tubes, where uh, Adam Strange works, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I just realized, I think this might be the first episode where the Airedale Initiative has actually got a name slapped on it. I'd have to go back and watch Season 2 to see if it comes up earlier. But it's named after the creator of the first Zeta Beam which is Dr. Saul Erdell, although they don't name him as Saul. Uh, I, I don't know whether that's his name or not. Now I question all of that. Uh, that was his name in the comics. Because Dr. Erdell's experiment is what pulled Martian Manhunter to Earth from Mars. According to the Ask Greg site, it happened in the Young Justice timeline in 1955. So 50 years before the League was founded, which according to Greg was in 2003, in the Young Justice timeline. So Martian Manhunter has been on Earth since 1955, and he didn't come in like a spaceship, you know, back and forth that apparently he theoretically is using to go back and forth to Mars now. it's He got pulled by a Zeta Beam, and there was no technology on Earth to help him get back <laughs> to Mars, and so he was stuck here, even though the Mars, you know, culture still existed. Uh, I guess there was no Martians on Earth at the time. Wow. <laughs> like, that was a bit of a hole... That I fell down. Uh, I didn't realize Martian Manhunter had been on Earth for 50 years, 50 plus years before the Justice League was even founded. So like yep. 60 years before the show starts. Gosh. It's like, hokey smokes. How old is he? And like, how old do Martians live? Like, I have all these questions now. I mean, obviously they live a while because wasn't Miss Martian 46 in Martian years, but 16 She's 16 years? in Martian years, which by Earth years is like three times is that is 46 years old or something, yeah. 48. Whatever something. the conversion factor is. <laughs> Whatever that is, right? So, yeah. John must be really old. John is as old as the plot demands. <laughs> yeah, and what's interesting to me is they live long and they have a lot of siblings. So, McGann said that she's got like 13 sisters or something like that. Yep. Right? <laughs> So they live hundreds of years and they're prolific in procreation. Like, why are they even still on Mars? Rich, or, <laughs> I don't <laughs> pretend to understand the full socio-political <laughs> like, landscape of Mars. Right. <laughs> I'm just saying. Evolutionarily, maybe she has a lot of sisters because they live long. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. There's something definitely going on there. I don't know, man. <laughs> Yeah. I can't unpack uh, that box. <laughs> and another deep dive. Uh sort of. Go for what it. What I mentioned earlier, Matthew Malone, right? Yes. So it took me it took me to this watching before I even paid attention to the name <laughs> of the character that Batman was playing. It's Matthew Malone. Uh aka in the comics matches Malone. Matches Malone first appeared in Batman number 242 and was this reoccurring alternate identity 
of Batman in the comics, and the, he showed up in the Batman the Animated Series. There's an episode of Batman Brave and the Bold where he uses that name. Bruce, me, in Batman Brave and the Bold, there's a brilliant episode we've talked about a couple times called The Chill of the Night when Bruce meets his parents in this kind of flashback time travel thing going on. Uh, it's amazing. But when he meets his dad, his dad's like, oh, what's your name? And he's like, Matthew Malone. Like, that's the name that pops out of his out of his mouth. Matches Malone was a was a character that Bruce would get into. I, I guess he was an actual mobster and then he was <laughs> murdered. And so then Bruce noticed like they had the same physique, similar physique. So he like took over that character. And so he would, that's how he would sneak in and get information about mob happenings and things like that in Gotham city was by playing this enforcer matches Malone. So this is how they incorporated matches Malone. I don't, I couldn't find anything on Mora being a thing before young justice. Um, so that may just be something that they introduced into the thing. And they were like, Oh, he's going to have an alternate identity. Oh, let's set it in Ireland and call him Malone and have the whole matches thing. Like there, there's definitely a conversation that happened around that. <laughs> and like what was, there was a whole conversation that happened around it, but was it just Batman made up a whole alternate identity or did they just briefly assume the identity of two real people? <laughs> Cause like there is a store there and stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, give give Bruce five minutes and he could buy anything he wants, I guess. But like, fair enough. I don't know. I fair don't know. Enough. I mean, I, I don't know how deep does a rabbit hole go on this one. It was not. A, I mean, <laughs> the Santa light. Right. Maybe. Uh, which brings me into like what the parallels between Batman and Lex <laughs> in this whole thing is super. Like Bruce, you get too many parallels to Lex and Deathstroke. Like this is you're walking thin lines there, buddy. <laughs> Real, real thin. <laughs> He's trying his best, maybe. I know. Question mark. He's doing his best. He's doing his best. My thing with Batman this episode is I just can't get over the fact that that scene that's featured in the montage is is him hugging Miss Martian. Because when you first see it, you're like, oh, that's cute. Yay, father-daughter reunion. And then you hear like the whole explanation for how this mission went down. And you're like, that's hilariously awkward. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, didn't think about that. Just being like, <laughs> hey, you got to hug Batman and pretend you're his daughter. Yeah. But Batman's a good dad in this universe, so, you know, it's not as awkward as some universes would be. That's right. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit. I, I, I wanted to drop this here just to kind of get your input, but I, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in the Canary Debrief. But I love how this conversation between the kids and their guardians slash parents, yep. it, is, it is not cliche. Nope. It is not typical. Uh, I was expecting something else, and I got good, healthy conversation. Right? This is about. This isn't about me. This is about Joan. Oh, like, wow, Bart. That's really deep. That's insightful, and may seem kind of obvious, but it may not be obvious, right? You know. Um, and they don't like yell. And They're like you. You told me that I could do this, and I'm gonna. You know, they don't have some kind of stereotypical like tantrum. It's everyone know? just so actually listening to each other and having a conversation. It's that thing that we talk about right. on Young Justice a lot. That's letting characters communicate instead of having non communication be drama. Like the yeah. episode near the end of season one where everybody reveals their secrets and everyone is like, "Yeah, oh, okay." Cool. Let's have yeah. a conversation yeah. about that. It has that same feeling. <laughs> Who's next? I was totally kidding. Yeah, it, it, it was that whole thing is something that I've always wanted to see. And what really caught me off guard, one of the that was that right there was one of the main points of watching the series the first time through without even seeing the extra stuff that happens in the background after watching it, you know, several times. That one scene right there was like, oh, this is completely different than what I was expecting it to be in such a good way, you know, for myself and my wife, when I watched when I watched it with her and she was like, Oh, I've been waiting for this kind of interaction for so long in shows. Yeah. Like, why don't you just tell your friends what's going on? Yeah. Right. Like, and see what happens, you know, like, I don't know. Then they all handle it so well. And this is another example of that. And, uh, I, Paul Giacopo, like hats off, but you know, yeah. you, you know that, you know, Greg and Brandon are like aiming these you know, stories in these particular directions of like, yes, we need this thing to happen, this discussion to happen, but you know, it needs to be <sighs> treat the kids with respect, you know, the, the not quite kids, you know, with respect. And I love it. 
but I'll, I'll talk yeah. more about it in detail in the, the Canary debrief. I also really love how they even point out like Beast Boy has the thing where he's just like, some of us are over 18. You can't stop us. Like they're like, they're, some of the people on this team are technically adults and they're allowed to go do this and they just walk out. It isn't like everyone's yeah. parents show up. It's like, nah, everyone has a different situation here and we're going to address a bunch of different dynamics right now. And it really works very well. Yeah. And also like they kind of respect what's happening. Yeah. Like Beast Boy's like, yeah, the rest of us, we're going to go do our thing. Like you guys need to have a conversation. That's fair. Yeah. Right. You guys need, I, I get it. That's fair. We got a thing that we got to go do. So are you guys good? Great. We're going to go. You take care of your thing. No one tries to just walk out of it. Right. Right. Exactly. A conversation needs to happen. And even, and even, you know, Cassie and, and Ed and uh, uh, Bart all know they get it. Yeah. Like we need to talk this out and we need to talk it out for us. And also Jay, you kind of need to talk it out for yourself. Like, I get it. You're feeling vulnerable right now. And I understand, but you trained me, you know, like, like this is what we do. And you know that, you yeah. know, and then when Jay comes back and he's got like, he's got like a, a social media account and just slams Lex and yes. puts like the whole thing about like the whole registration act in the fifties didn't work and we're not standing for it again. You jerk. Like, I love it. Yeah. I love every bit of it. And it's just absolutely humiliating to Lex, which is probably extremely dangerous. <laughs> Let's humiliate just Lex. A I'm sure he'll just take it. Just a I'll just he'll just take it sitting down because that's what Lex does. <laughs> yeah, but I, was, I wanted to hand it back to you because there's a bunch of stuff in here that I love that you put in notes, and particularly this number one because I agree 100. percent Gosh, I just I love random little things, and it, it wraps into how a lot of this episode is about family and talking to people. I love the idea that the Wonder Family just has like interspace Skype calls. I love that right? that's a thing. <laughs> Uh, and right. I love, and it's one of those things in Young Justice where a lot of shows would be like, someone is off planet. You can't talk to them, and you're going to have all this drama about missing your family and all of this stuff, and not being able to know if they're safe. And Young Justice is like, video chat exists. Use it. Uh, yeah, and, and I, I love, love I I love the scene where Diana's like, sister, what's happening? What's going on? And like, I can't remember who Halo said it was, was like, was it? It's fine, Wonder Woman. We're handling it's it. It's like, we got it. We got it. We're here. Because I'm sure like Wonder Woman feels better. Like I don't, I'm, the camera's facing a wall right now and I don't know what's happening. I hear combat, right? Yes. And Halo's like, we're here. We got it. It's all good. We're okay. She's okay. You know, like. is important. Exactly. One of, one oh, of my it. notes on this episode is just how I really like how s so much of this episode is just like dedicated to how important it is to communicate <laughs> with other people. It's little things like that, but it's the conversation with the parents. It's the fact that while the conversation with the parents is going on, Brio and Tara and Halo are having their whole thing upstairs, which is all just about like, what if you told the truth and communicated with the people you care about? And I'm like, wow, yeah. <laughs> on a superhero show? <laughs> right. <laughs> what a novel concept. <laughs> That's right. But random other stuff from this episode on this million three watch. I noticed a cool little detail from from the assassination presentation <laughs> scene. Blooper reel. Uh, <laughs> that, remember how back in season one, when Cheshire attacks the team for the first time, Aqualad mentions oh, that right. Atlanteans have very, very tough skin. Right, yeah, uh, yeah. The first couple of darts that hit Garth bounce off him. <laughs> it's not Perfect. until one hits him in the neck that one actually works and i was like nice a very yeah, a very nice awesome. little detail right there someone paid attention <laughs> yeah yeah i also love in that entire combat scene that we get the implication that mcgann has figured out a way to do psychic battle without killing somebody and that's cool yeah. uh we don't get to also, see it like i spent that whole no. scene the first time through being like show me the mind palace and they're like oh, no 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 we don't need to do that uh, it also reminded me how horrifying she can be like, yeah, cause she's just turns her eyes start glowing. She's just casually just smacking this person around. Like she's just standing there, you know, like glowing with the, with the eyes and then like just collapses. And then she just kind of raises her hand and like holds it and then shatters her helmet and like turns her around and pulls the thing off. And I'm just like, she doesn't, this is just like swatting a fly to her. Uh, 
Yeah, kind of. I always forget how how sweet. <laughs> Ball of sunshine, she's terrifying a, demigod. You can demigod. Be yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> she's finding a non-lethal, non-destructive way to subdue a combatant. It's good. That's right. It's a good thing to know how to do, even if it looks terrifying. Yeah, absolutely. Because the girl's absolutely. fine afterward. I also love the running joke that. Kid Flash is just off screen being like, I'm I'm fine. I'm gonna be right. fine. Like at everything. <laughs> well, like Bart almost died today. And he's like on the other side of the room. He's like, I'm he's like, I'm right good. here. I'm, I'm fine. Why is everyone using me? <laughs> why did I come You're making the tool me see- for this? <laughs> yeah, why am I in the middle of this? See, speed speed healing factor. Hello. It's, it's I'm okay. Good. The whole team just up and leaves because solidarity after like yeah. McGann confronts Halo and uh, Ed and his dad have their whole thing. And I just love how it's one of those quintessentially like teen hero moments where they all know they're like, there's no reason for all of us to walk away other than friendship. Yep. <laughs> they're like, this because isn't friendship. a strategic choice. This doesn't make any right. sense, but we're, we're leaving. <laughs> darn it. <laughs> That's right. We're making a point here. Just- why not just friendship? Why not just friendship? <laughs> I on this on this again this million three watch. I was thinking about how that scene with Halo and Brion up in her room where he's just like, "What's wrong? What did I do? What's going on? Why are you acting different?" I think there is an interpretation of this that you could have that Halo brings up Harper first thinking it'll push Brion away without her having to actually reveal the whole truth on some level. Like, I think she is trying to be like, yeah, Here, here's a thing that happened. Are you mad at me? Because if you're mad at me about this, it's easier for me to tell you this other thing. And instead, Brion is like, it's fine. I understand. Things happen. It's okay. And she's like, dang it. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Here it comes. Which leads to, I think it's fascinating and very cool storytelling that Tara doesn't say anything. Tara just starts having a panic attack and it's framed and portrayed like a panic attack, essentially upon finding out that Gabrielle Dow helped kill her parents. But again, rewatching this and thinking so much more about Tara and Deathstroke and all that since everything, it feels very much on this watch through Like, she's kind of using Deathstroke as a coping mechanism. It's a way for her to, like, just completely relinquish control and let someone else tell her what to do when she feels completely powerless. Because her, I mean, like, she can't breathe and she pulls out her phone and sends a relatively cheery text to Deathstroke, just hoping, like, tell me what to do. If you tell me what to do, I don't have to process this. I don't have to think about my emotions. I don't have to think about how this hurts if someone else is giving me orders. And the way they animate that scene, those scenes as well, yeah. like this kind of narrowing tunnel vision where you're kind of focused on something, but not focused on something, um, the heartbeat, the breathing, like everything about that made me feel anxious in like, like yes. really translated those emotional states, which is, which is not easy to, I don't know. It, it's not a first instinct to, to do that took some, again, some thought and detail about the uh, anxiety reactions. Yeah. You know? But it works. It's real good. It's beautiful. Real good. Gosh, I love animation. I love the things we can do <laughs> with art. You seem to me to be someone who likes things. <laughs> yep. Who would have guessed? <laughs> who would have guessed? I also got a laugh this time through during Lex Luthor's interview with G. Gordon Godfrey when he's explaining what went down in Ireland. And it's just like the predictable result an explosion. <laughs> I'm just like, wow, I love how in-universe this has become a thing. Right. It's like, stealth mission. No, no, blow up a building. Right, right. And I I really love that talk show interview scene just in general. Like, I love the inclusion of social media. We've talked about it before. It's this really cool way of like fleshing out the world and just being like, superheroes have secret identity Twitter accounts. And I'm like, that's great. Please, more of this. I love this. <laughs> Has Jay been verified? That's what I want to know. So a little Not blue. Yet. I don't he's remember. New. There's he's a little blue new. check. Uh, oh, okay, it's too new. He's okay. too new to flitter That's international. <laughs> <laughs> and also the way that they just kind of casually throw in the idea 
that a superhero registry just sort of happened in the 1950s and doesn't or, exist or tried anymore. to happen. Yeah. The way like, cause Lex Luthor says it as like, like we had in the 1950s. And I'm like, that implies that this was a thing that existed. Yeah. Uh, not that it was something that tried to happen, but that it was a thing that happened and then eventually got rolled back. And the fact, and like yeah. the fact that it's just introduced as kind of like this minor world building detail, just an offhand comment from Lex Luthor, and I'm just like, "Where's my flashback comic? I want, I want the political yeah. drama comic that's just explaining how this happened. I want this." And uh, now, did, did Martian Manhunter appear on Earth and become a superhero during the middle of that in 1955? That would be interesting right because you're rolling out of world war ii you still got the justice society who are still clearly active wait does that mean martian manhunter was in justice society we've i have so many questions (laughs) welcome to whelm the young justice files also known as rich and emily scream and have a lot of questions (laughs) absolutely but i think that is that is most of my stuff all right Let's head into a mid-roll, and then after that, a little canary debrief, uh, some fan service, and we will crash what modes there are to crash. Ah, yeah. Uh, Welcome to the Fake Your Own Death Club. Its membership is very exclusive, and I'm the president. Hello, team, and welcome to the mid-roll. This week, we have a new five-star review. Amazing! Exclamation point from J420420420. Very subtle tag there. (laughs) If you like Young Justice at all, you'll love it more after listening to the podcast. I was pretty diehard before finding this, but it encourages and enriched countless rewatches of every episode. A must listen. Thank you. I'll just say Jay. Thank you, Jay. Uh, On a creator parallel Young Justice note, uh, Disney Plus is now out in the world and included in the subscription is a wide range of older Disney shows, including Gargoyles, all three seasons. Uh, as Gargoyles started trending almost immediately, Greg has spearheaded a hashtag keep binging YJ style campaign to get Gargoyles back on the air and finish the story that he started back in the 90s. Hashtag keep binging Gargoyles is the hashtag he's asked people to use. If you use different hashtags, they might be cool, uh, but those uh, hashtags can't keep things focused like a spearhead. So if we can start from the beginning doing the keep binging gargoyles one that Greg suggests, that may keep things moving. If you, for some reason, haven't seen gargoyles and have a Disney Plus subscription, we can't recommend it highly enough. We're going to have some links a little bit later to discuss some other things about gargoyles. And with all that out of the way, let's get back to the show. Stick around. Class is in session. In our Canary Debrief, we'll be discussing what we can learn about the creative process from the episodes that we review. One of the things, as I mentioned earlier, that jumps out at me about this episode and Young Justice since season one, as we were talking about, is the responsibility and communication that the creators demonstrate. I've been trained by poor plotting and characterization to expect a yelling match between the parents and guardians and their children. Instead, as soon as Jay starts getting his point across, escalating his point and his emotions, Bart de-escalates the conflict by seeking to understand Jay and where he's coming from. We can't truly know and understand everything about someone else's experiences. And we should obviously refrain, maybe not obviously to some people, refrain from trying to tell someone how or why they feel the way that they feel but we can seek to understand where someone's feelings are coming from and, and touch on why. Bart doesn't simply fight Jay because, you know, quote, independence or, quote, hypocrisy or, you know, why not friendship, right? Why not just friendship? And Cass doesn't dismiss her mother's concerns. She actually embraces her mother's concerns, just like, like gives them validity and then continues the conversation. Ed doesn't dismiss his father's concern because they've had rough times and he doesn't use them to make his father the antagonist in his entire life. Like the three of these incredible teenagers accept the adults in their lives, respect them as human beings with love and worry and protective concern. And they redirect that energy. They de-escalate the emotional reactions to get them to come to a consensus between the six of them. And the adults get this credit as well. They listen to 
their kids. They respect their viewpoints. They allow a relationship to develop and evolve and to move forward. And when you're writing interactions between adults and children or adults and teenagers in your work, remember that children are not like, quote, undeveloped humans. (laughs) They are humans. Teenagers aren't imbalanced humans. They're all humans, full stop. They are beings doing the best they can with the tools that they have. And when they are treated with respect, you may be surprised at where your characters will take your story for you. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. All right. In fan service, we take some time to highlight the amazing fan-related creations celebrating DC Young Justice and other creative works that we think Young Justice fans will love. So earlier uh, during our mid-roll, we mentioned that Gargoyles is now on Disney+, and that Greg has, Greg Weissman has, uh, being the co-creator of Gargoyles as well, uh, started a campaign to spearhead the return of Gargoyles. Just like with Young Justice, he had a lot of things he wanted to do with later seasons that he didn't get to do. So to if you want to know more about Gargoyles, even if you don't have a Disney Plus account, if you do, go watch it. If you don't, that's fine. Go check out the Gameable Saturday Morning Podcast. They did an entire month of analyzing Gargoyles. So they talk about the history of the show. They talk about a lot of things having to do with Gargoyles, four full multiple hour long episodes um, analyzing the show. And if you're a gamer, bonus content, uh, Gameable Saturday Morning takes these cartoons and animated series and movies, analyzes them from a storyline perspective, just like we do here on Whelmed, and then applies them to role-playing game scenarios and situations uh, that you can use. Um, in addition, of course, to these four, the four full episodes of Gargoyles, you can actually go back as well, and I guested on the show to talk about Young Justice. So if you enjoy the Gargoyles one and you want to hear me off the off the hook talking about gaming and Young Justice, we'll put those notes in the uh, show notes as well. All right. What do we got? Do we have any... Uh, let's uh, crash the mode. Do we have any crash the mode? Let's try it. We have a couple of very, very small crash the modes. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that. We're all feeling the mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in Season 3. In Crashing the Mode, we'll be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on wild flights of fancy. If you are spoiler wary, this is your warning. Uh, So, what's up with JSwatch 2019? Hashtag JSwatch 2019. (laughs) Subtitle of Crashing the Mode for Season 3. She is for once do? not doing much. She yeah. only briefly mentions her mentor this week. Mm, but let's check in. We'll check back in with next week. She's awful, and we distrust her. Yeah, because we've with seen the, infamous, the whole season. The infamous we know phone to etiquette, her. right? <laughs> Gosh, but a different, very small crash in the mode because it's going to pay off in one episode. Near the very beginning of this, somebody briefly asked, like, wait, where's Forager? And someone just says, yeah, he's off looking for Victor. And someone's like, I, yeah, I never see him around much. I live here and I don't see him, whatever it is. And they just kind of move on. The next episode opens with where Victor's been and Forager looking for him. Nice. Poor, poor good alien boy has been wandering Hollywood for like <laughs> over 24 hours looking yeah. for his friend. I didn't. I I didn't check the second timestamp. So what? So the first one was literally one minute after midnight on New Year's. That's where yes. the scene was with. But then, the next. How long? How long? The next one is on that? January second. The next one is Whoa. over twenty four hours later. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Cool. So at some point during the day of January first, Forager headed out uh, and did not find Victor until the next day. Is wow. what these what these timestamps and character discussions imply. Nice. <laughs> Maybe he came home, had a snack, had a nap, and headed out again. I don't know. I hope so. Take <laughs> care know. of yourself, honey. Uh, <laughs> but have an apple. Yes. Yeah. Have a few. Yeah. Have a few apples. Yeah. Take care of yourself when you're searching for your robot friend. <laughs> right. And then it was sniffing him out, smelling him. Apparently. 
That's the whole thing. We'll get into that later on. We'll get into on. that next uh, week. <laughs> but with Forager's heightened sense of smell, uh, we can then head out of the Watchtower, I think. <laughs> Thank you all for spending time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the yjfiles.tumblr.com, on our website, crashingthemode.com. And if that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. Of course, you can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help other people find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S., since we have to look a little harder to find those ones. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours, under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.